Yes, today's Monday. <laughs> so today was our pickup day and it cut, they're here by about 7 to 7.30 in the morning. And my neighbors, most of my neighbors had their garbage cans out at noon yesterday. On paper, we're not supposed to have them out till after four o'clock. Welcome to Real Siblings, It Ain't Easy, a real estate podcast with the goal to educate, inform, and save their listeners time as they navigate the market and properties in their neighborhoods. Get ready to join real-life siblings and professional real estate advisors, Donna Reed and Eric Seaman, as they discuss how it may be simple, but it ain't always easy. Every time I think about the places I have known, I realize that times have changed, so I'll do what I can to make this house. Home. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hi everyone and welcome to Real Siblings, It Ain't Easy. I'm Eric Seaman, Realtor with Keller Williams Heritage in San Antonio, Texas, and I am here with my sister. I am Donna Reed and I'm with Keller Williams Southern Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. For our regular listeners, you will know this is not your typical real estate podcast, and if you're new, we are not your run-of-the-mill host. Where you live, how you live, and what type of property you call home reflects your life, livelihood, and your lifestyle. Donna and I work to blend lifestyle together with real estate to entertain and inform our listeners. We grew up in the village of Lindsay, Ohio from the late 1950s through the 1970s. In the 1980s, Donna, now married, returned to raise her family. The combination of what we refer to as our idyllic lifestyle together with memorable homes irrevocably impacted our lives and careers in real estate in the Southwest states we now call home. We have recognized that the properties are only a portion of the equation and that the balance is comprised of our life and upbringing in that small farming town. We hope we will be successful in providing you expert knowledge of our markets while we share some history, statistics, or simply information about the real estate market you may not be aware of. And with that lovely introduction, gosh, somebody's really, really good. Donna's sliding to the side in the YouTube video, and we're talking trash to treasures. That's right. Today, we're talking trash. I just got to be honest, in putting this all together, trying to move this ahead to season two, I put together a production schedule for 2023. We had talked. What? I said you're organized, unlike me, who's like, what are we talking about today? (laughs) Had put that together, and we spent a lot of time talking goals and gem show and things like that that were very lifestyle. I thought, you know what? Let's just talk trash. It sounded like it would be a lighthearted subject, but as we prepared for this and even discussed, now we're ready to record going, okay, there's a lot more to this than what we originally thought. And to be honest, when I put it together, Donna, I was thinking more about what I experienced as a real estate agent in a neighborhood. And San Antonio, with its growth and development and everything, we have a lot of neighborhoods that have what I refer to as a 10-foot curb cut which means the houses are so close together. If you've got mirror images of houses, you have only 10 foot between you and your neighbor's driveway, Um, leaving space for maybe one car. Right. right. If it's a narrow street and there's cars parked on both sides, only one car can make it down the road at a time. Now add in the fact that you've got trash bins that you're putting out there because men don't jump off of a trash truck anymore like they did in our day yeah it's some sort of mechanical mechanized pick it up if it's not turned exactly right it's going to be and in san antonio now i don't know about tucson there's three different bins that go with our solid waste management and they're out four times a day because waste pickup is twice a week so in a neighborhood each person would have three different bins out? yes every so- house wow. has three different bins and they're huge wow. they give you a 64 gallon you can yeah. downsize to a 48 gallon if you're not producing a whole lot of trash. Right. And if you're a heavy trash producer, you can upgrade to a 96 gallon. Mm-hmm. That's that's a lot of dumpster. I just I, it's it's <laughs> it's interesting to me because I think that sometimes they're different colors depending on what they're for. So I just I'm I'm picturing this colorful array of garbage cans, you know. And else. that's exactly what you get. But you've got waste on one day and waste being the trash that's going to go into a landfill. 
the okay. stuff that, and yeah. then you've got a day that's recycling. Okay. And then they broke it down further from there. And now we've got organics or compostables. Oh, wow. Depending on, you've got to know what you got, goes in where, what can be sorted. Are you putting brown cardboard, which could be considered to be organic or compostable in with your recycling, or have you moved it over there? And what do they accept and what don't they accept? Yeah, yeah. But it's these bins that are never ending on the side of a road and HOAs don't Mm -hmm. like them sitting out in front of your garage, right? In your townhomes of Las Quintas, are you allowed to set your dumpsters in front of your garage door? You know, when I was on the HOA board, we talked about how long in advance it can be out at the street. And I noticed, is today Monday? Yes, today's Monday. <laughs> so today was our pickup day and it they're here by about 7 to 7.30 in the morning. And my neighbors, most of my neighbors had their garbage cans out at noon yesterday. On paper, we're not supposed to have them out till after four o'clock. So that, yeah. Wait, wait, day- wait, until four o'clock in the morning? No, four o'clock the day before. So they're not supposed to be out all afternoon. But when I came home yesterday around like 1.32, Half my neighbors already had their stuff out. Now, the other piece of that is, it's depending on the weather and if there's javelina running around, they, they can get into the garbage can. So there's a little bit of logic to that, but I typically don't put mine out till eight or nine at night. And it's just funny that to say that, but no, we can't leave them sit out in the driveway. They have to- Okay, and think yeah. of your Arizona heat. What, what's yeah. your average temperature at right now? Um, Actually, today was one of the first days that I turned on the air conditioner. So I think the house was like at 80 inside. So probably 90 outside. So 90 degrees outside. We're not to May yet. And if you put trash out on four o'clock the day before and it sits there all night, if it survives the javelinas, then you've got it roasting in the sun. It is composting itself. It it gets picked (laughs) up. And if someone's decided to eat seafood, I don't know about you, but I think seafood trash yeah, the, the bags, oh, if you've got fresh seafood or something like that. Oh, or my. chicken, chicken bones. Yeah, chicken. Oh, bacon. my yeah. gosh. Do, do you have one trash dumpster in Tucson or do I, you have more? So it's interesting because we're just I'm just helping a friend going through this and he's kind of cheap and he didn't buy things. So my friend Steve. So he just uses small cans and his kids are like, man, there's not enough room. I have a waste management trash can that the neighbor gave me because our trash pickup provider wasn't giving them out anymore. So that's not who picks them up. You used to get one when you moved in. Nope, not anymore. Now you got to go buy one. So everybody else has these blue ones. And then I have a recycle container because I have good neighbors. And I live alone, so I don't have a ton to recycle. They get picked up the same day, about two or three hours apart, you know? I think they're all just blue. I don't think they're different colors. And if I do my recycles with papers, I'm supposed to put them in a clear garbage bag as compared to another. But you also mentioned, Eric, you also mentioned cardboard, which I thought was interesting because, you know, you can't, you get so many things now, Amazon comes, right? You have all these waxy cardboards. I don't know if the waxy cardboard can be recycled the same way as like the other. And if you get pizza sauce or pizza grease, they're not. They're not supposed to take it. So yeah, yeah. your melted cheese and your greasy pizza boxes don't count as being recyclable. They have to go into the trash. You mentioned Amazon. Amazon ships 608 million packages per year in the United States. Wow. Wow. And about 50% of their packaging is what? Brown right? Yeah. Most of your Amazon packages, whatever you get is inside another brown box. That's true. A box in paper a box. dunnage or something else to kind of keep it from sliding around. Yep. Only 50% of that ends up being recycled. Yeah. And unless something, like you said, unless there's oil been dripped on it, something broke, most of that can be recycled and it's not. You know, I just was doing my backsplash in my kitchen. So they were wooden boxes with super great foam with another box that had the tile inside it with another piece of the foam over top in the brown box. Today, when the garbage went, all those waxy ones, they went in the regular garbage. They didn't go in the recycles, whereas the brown will, or I'll try to reuse it. All right. So do you consider yourself to be a big trash producer? No. And and those numbers, so you guys, Eric was reading me numbers because you know he does this research, and I think he's, I was going to say full of crap, full of trash. <laughs> No, we're talking sewers and septics on another episode. Remember, we already said that. I I originally had that down as one of the possible topics today. But there's so much to talk about with trash. We didn't need to talk about crap. What do we learn about how much trash we produce? Because no, I do not think I... I Okay, so these are numbers based on the Environmental Protection Agency. 
who looks at the amount of all material produced within the United States that goes to trash or waste. And mm -hmm. it's 268 million tons, which means we're producing trillions of pounds of trash. Mm -hmm. When you take a look at the, the population, and they use a number of just over 326 and a half million people, or just under 326 and a half million people, based on what we produce, on average, the United States citizen produces four and a half pounds of trash a day. Yeah, and I told you, I don't think I do, because I don't, well, first of all, I'm cheap, like our father was. and You're I read, frugal. I, frugal. I rewash my baggies. I don't always put my produce in a bag at the store. Like I don't even take those little thin ones. The other day I, I mixed broccoli, green onions, and avocados into one bag so that I had one bag instead of three. I, I just don't think I use that much. Now I work hard at it too. I have to say, I really do. There's been a transition in life, right? Trying to be careful about what I consume and what I use and what I, what pollutes and things like that. I'm going to say but, I'm more but think of your pantry. Again. If you go into your pantry, yeah, how much of that is going to go in a dumpster? Well, a lot of it eventually, but not four, not four pounds a day. Not four pounds a day. But remember, I told you this is this is about averages. So you have to take into account all of the grow the packaging that got groceries from a farmer in California to get strawberries to your what, what's your grocery store? Farm ninety nine. No, I was at Sprouts. That's where I went to. Okay, so you go to Sprouts. You're responsible and assigned a portion of that waste gets assigned to you. Oh, just because of the whole chain. Just because of the whole chain. Mm. So if there's pallets that are destroyed that can't be recycled, you get associated to a certain amount of pallet trash. Mm. If that styrofoam, even though it's not heavy, but all of that ultimately goes into it. If you yeah. go to Starbucks, sorry, I really, my glasses have really gotten messed up. I'm, <laughs> ah, okay. If you go to a Starbucks, a portion of the Starbucks trash because they went through X number of half gallons of plastic milk jugs gets assigned to you. Got it. Okay. Okay. It isn't part and parcel to what I am using specifically in my home. It's the whole chain of. of right. And because we live out in the country, yeah, we have a septic system. Yeah. If I put food down into a garbage disposal, there is a potential with the septic system that I am introducing seeds into the septic system, which are then going to grow, and I'm going to end up with volunteer organic material in what? there. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Oh my so God. no tomatoes, no cucumbers, no anything like that. Everything goes over our hillside. Everything. And I don't do a compost, the animal. Yeah. but I have all kinds of varmin and vermin and we've even gotten to the point where right now we have a uh, what's known as a ringtail cat oh. kind of nesting up in one of the nooks created by our roof addition over our deck really and a couple of years ago when we had been gone for a couple of days there was one down on the ground looking up at us on the deck almost cursing at us because we'd left and hadn't thrown everything out for a couple of days but if it's watermelon rinds or pumpkin rinds or potato skins or eggshells all of it over the edge. all right okay so before we started this we we also then kind of flashed back to our childhood because that's what we do and we're trying to remember even what things were like it's interesting to think about all of it now when i think about um dad having a garden and how much we got out of the garden with seeds that he grew or something like that so we didn't have that whole process of garbage which i guess everybody living off the land but that's part of the reason people are going back to that right and then, and then we also were able to rake and burn leaves and things like that. And we had fireplaces. Fire so if a branch places. blew down, you didn't have to, you trimmed your trees, you'd cut it up. So it would be firewood for the next year. Not right. Right. worry about bulk trash, picking it up on your curbside because it's bulk trash day. And then I couldn't, <clears throat> excuse me. I couldn't remember when I was living there with the kids. So I texted Adam and Adam said that they did do trash pickup when we lived on Walnut street. He goes, I remember dad building a, what did he call it? He said like a capture place for the cans. Cause you and I were talking about what was allowed to be exposed. He said he called it a docking bay, like for the trash cans. Which, yeah. <laughs> a docking he goes, bay. Yeah, he goes, it was by the maple tree that we climbed on. Okay. And then he said, so that was on, on that's funny. On Walnut Street near Elm by the maple tree. Gotta love small towns. 
<laughs> and, then, yeah. and then when he said when we were down on Main Street, I don't even, I doubt that he knows he used all those tree types. When we were on Main Street, he said we did have trash cans because he said, I remember having to haul them to the end of the driveway. That was a long driveway. And then we stored them back kind of by the basketball hoop and stuff at the back by the barn back there. So we had that little barn that was. A yeah. Just so you of- guys had a good haul to get yeah. it all the way down the driveway and around from the barn and that sort of thing. It's pretty but, funny that I don't remember it all, which means either I forced the children to do it or Bill took care of it. I, I really, I don't remember. I remember having a metal trash can. When we came down on the Lynn Street house, you'd go out the mudroom, so yeah. kitchen to mudroom, and down the stairs, and right there next to the lower stair to the right-hand side was a trash can. You're right. Is that the And we would, we would put trash in there, but who picked it up? So you know what, Dad? And Dad burned a lot out in his shop. He too. did. So he would work out there. I think he used that probably as much as the fireplace inside he would burn. Yeah, that's like. right. And he used that smoke to hide the fact that he he was We're still, still smoking away for years too. after he. Uh... I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> we would take the stuff out of the house and burn it. And never mind that I'm going to sneak a cigarette. That's right. You know, he, he finally quit, quit. When? 1989. I was I'm, out of the house. I, I he, the he threw the last pack away that we know that he ever smoked. On the way out to my graduation, from out at college. from college. No, at Army. Army. Okay. okay. Yeah, my officer basic course. Funny the things you remember. So now, okay, you and I talked a little bit. So I was thinking about where we live differently. So Dan in um, medium size Manhattan, college, Kansas. Manhattan, Kansas, medium size college town. He's now also. I'm calling to all my brothers or country brothers at this point, kind of sorta. And so Dan's a little bit out of town. And from what I recall, they recycle four different ways. So I think they actually do glass and do different colors and things like that. And then because he's Dan and is very organized, he smashes all the soda cans and waits until they're really small before he hauls them and then he takes them. So he takes them to distribute them to different places. And Eric, after we after we started chatting about what we were going to talk about, I thought back in the day when things were glass, you got like five cents or something like that. People returned bottles because right. they, you know. And that was part of the, Michigan was one of the big ones at 10 cents a bottle. Yes, you're right. There so so when you paid order. for a case of beer in college. Yeah, who never did that. <laughs> you were, we, but the, my roommates, when we first moved out, uh, Rich, Dave, Conrad, and I would get, go to Myers Thrifty Acres, and they had recyclable bottles in a beer they called Meisterbrow. Yeah. And when I say they recycled the bottles, I think they washed them. They didn't make them new because those <laughs> bottles would come back kind of scraped and chipped and you knew who knows what. Yeah, it was not the king of beers. It was anything but. Oh, but that's what funny. You, what, you did, what you did. But we pick up that case. We'd have to pay $2.40 for that. Wow. Just in the deposit, whatever the beer was. So and then we, we talked about the fact that as a Boy Scout, mm, paper drives yeah. in the 1970s became really, really a big deal. And we would regularly go around town and pick up newspapers. And of course, yeah. since Ken and I and Dan all kind of fed that at one point because we yeah. sold the newspapers, kind of brought it full circle because then we would be picking them up, bundling them. And at one point there was the laundromat Wow. In town that went out of business. And we stored the newspapers inside the laundromat until we took them in bulk and dropped them off someplace to be recycled. Did you, did you think they, do you have to go to Toledo for that? Do you think? I think, I don't remember going to Toledo. I so, think we took them into Fremont. Fremont would have a collection. Now, Fremont might have taken them up to Toledo. I don't know what the chain was at that point. And when we were really little, when we were little kids, on the way down to the cemetery, there was a dump. And at this point, and I remember going down there with dad, and I remember everybody hauling things down there. I can't visually picture anything specific that was there. And I don't know if there were rules. I think as the years went by, there were rules, you know, about what could be put there. But at that point, it was. All right. Take it, take it back another generation. Now you remember being out at grandma's farm. Yeah. 
and you'd go out to the woods, you'd go take the sled that they yeah. built to pull behind the tractor, we'd yeah. load that up with trash, yeah. you'd drag it past the fields, and you'd go back to the dump site they had in the woods. Yeah, good point. And wow. you had drums so that were going back there to the 1930s, and that's yeah. why when I list land, there is yeah. an environmental questionnaire because in land that has been out there for generations, pretty much a guaranteed there's a dump site somewhere on that land, that property. Yeah. Even if the yeah. current great great grandson doesn't know about it, it's there. So we bring it up from a discussion standpoint because leaky oil cans, pesticides, yeah. fertilizers, the, I mean, just the, the grand combination of everything. The other thing you and I just said we wanted to talk about before we ended the episode was actually the upcycling. The, yes, which is why I mean, your background, trash to treasures. Yes, trash to treasures. First of all, I didn't like that slogan being like, one man's trash is another <laughs> man's treasure. Or woman's, sorry. Where, 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 what, 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 where, what word would you be assigned to how you were feeling there? Um, minimized? Minimized. Were, you, were you being minimized? Were you being... I was I was almost in tears. No, I wasn't. But anyway, but I liked this question. <laughs> so, but, but I told Eric to leave the picture up that he had of his wall behind him because Eric has an eclectic gathering of things behind him. But, you know, that Coke thing that you've had there, you've had there for years, 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 years. I'm not even... That's talking. right. Those are both delivery for old bottles of Coke going yep. back to the 1920s, 1930s. Yep. And yep. this is... Actually, in our project we did, I saw something that's a recycled uh, license plate. Yeah. And then if you if you lean a little bit to your left, then you can see the Texas US 66. So when I had the Just Be Claws business in uh, Ohio, the place where I had those made or right around there, he, they actually made those Route 66 things, which I thought was fascinating because I don't know that any part of Ohio was on Route 66. Yeah. So there, no. there's a lot that goes into this. And what originally started as just being a man, those dumpsters in a neighborhood are really a pain in the neck. Yeah. And you're constantly dodging and weaving the trash trucks. And if it's a windy day, they blow down and they block the road and then people run over them and then you've got to replace yeah. them and it, they cause accidents and it yeah. just. Yeah. All sorts, all sorts of stuff, things and stuff. But man, we put a lot of trash out there. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I just saw, Eric, because I have all the silver that I don't know what to do with this, that was either mom's or grandma's or I don't know where it came from. Um, and I'm not even sure if it's silver or silver plate, but I never use it. This is my 23rd year in Arizona and I've never used it. And I was up in Phoenix at a market, you know, or whatever, one of the outdoor markets, and somebody was taking the old silver and making jewelry out of it. And, what and have I you seen where they take the old silver forks and turn it into a wind chime? Yes. They'll melt yeah. the tines and, then, and they put it and they curve it. And then they've got a little yep. silver fork wind chime. Yep. And if, if I'd had the money or thought I needed it and it wasn't just remodeling the kitchen, they had an old pitcher that was copper that was on an angle like this, which those of you watching will be able to see. And hanging up from it were all the different pieces of silverware. And I loved it because I'm putting a lot of copper in my kitchen. And I thought, man, what a smart thing to do as compared to just melting it, getting rid of it. Does it melt if it's silver plate? Is it worth anything? I don't know. I don't know. And then the, there's the additional. I have one additional note on my side talking about those big major events. How much additional trash oh. is produced in Tucson during Gem Show? Oh, How I, much additional trash is produced on a football Saturday because of the tailgating and that sort of thing and what that does to us? And all of that gets assigned to us as well. Right wow. now, we're wrapping up here in San Antonio Fiesta. Ten days of parties, events, parades, carnivals. It is loaded with additional trash. Yeah. What about yeah. New Orleans and, the, and Mardi Gras trash? Mardi Gras. All of the beads and everything that go along there. New York and Times Square. They talk about how many tons of paper are going to be picked up and recycled. There's yeah. a lot of lot more we can talk about with trash, and we may have to do that in another episode. Keep, keep talking about trash as we get to Christmas. Maybe we'll minimize our decorations. That's right. Know. That's why we recycle our pay our wrapping paper. <laughs> and we fold our tissue paper. We use it in the gift bags two, three, four times. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. All right. That or because we're cheap. One or the other. Close this episode, sister. All righty. Thanks, everybody, for listening and joining us. We do like to remember our childhood in Lindsay, Ohio, and how we were impacted and it affected our lives and careers in real estate. As you clearly know at this point, it isn't just the houses or just the lifestyle. It's a combination of the two, which we bring forward into our life right now. As we wrap this one up, please bear in mind that our goal is to communicate and educate you and entertain. 
Hopefully we entertain you and connect with you, our listeners. We entertain, <laughs> we entertain ourselves. <laughs> Dad, go. Yes, we are. We're good at that. <laughs> so if you're in Arizona and specifically the Tucson area, I'm available to assist you while Eric is in South Central Texas in San Antonio. We are both realtors. <laughs> He's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> we are both realtors with Keller Williams, and we're here to help you find the perfect property for your family to call home and create your own lasting memories in a lifestyle that you choose. If you're across the United States or around the world, we're part of an extensive network of professionals and advisors, and we would be happy to connect you with an amazing realtor. So here we go, Eric. Remember, it may be simple, but it ain't always easy. Until next time, I'm Donna. And I'm Eric. And we are... Real siblings. Real siblings. Hey! <laughs> Hi, y'all. Every time I think about the places I have known, I realize that times have changed. So I'll do what I can to make this house into a home. I'm Annabelle, and I want to thank you for investing your valuable time in listening to Real Sibling. It ain't easy. I hope you found this episode informative and enjoyable. There are several ways you can support this podcast with my grandpa Eric and Aunt Grandma. Please take the time to like, follow, and subscribe. Additionally, leave them a five-star rating along with a review on your preferred podcast platform. The final thing I would ask is that you recommend this podcast to a friend, a family member, or an associate. Your engagement is critical to their ongoing success, and they look forward to connecting. Check out the show notes Grandpa put together with their contact information, including emails, phone numbers, and websites. And remember, the real siblings look forward to hearing from you.